That almost went for a button. Right. Well, them discs. Here we go. Do do do. Uh, bit in window. Oh, bit in int window. There we go. A guide for those people who think Star Wars is an old movie. <laughs> This is the forward by Terry Pratchett. Okay. Um, technically, film noir means black film. But, look, you know what it has come to mean? Even if you didn't know what it was called, because I doubt if there was ever, if there has ever been a movie style that can be so recognizably parodied, film noir is what you get when you stir together the Maltese Falcon, the Big Sleep, Casablanca, to have and have not, and several dozen other movies made in the 40s and the 50s. The weather is bad, the lighting is low, the streets are mean, life is cheap, and the women are tougher than nails and have shoulder pads on which a competent pilot could land a small jet. People tend to lie a lot and double-cross one another. It's the monochrome world of cynical detectives, with their names spelled backwards on glass doors, of seedy offices and a bottle of rye in their desk drawer. And people smoked a lot, probably because of the stress of lying, double-crossing, bad weather and walking into furniture in the low light. Technically, it died out in the mid-50s, and the lighting of... and the lightning of the post-war gloom, but surfaces... In countless parodies, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, homages Blade Runner, and references so ingrained in popular culture that you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, even if you've never seen one of those movies. Play it again, Sam! Um, a guide for those who think fantasy only comes in brick-thick volumes. Discworld is... But you're, but you've just, God Lord, this world is, but you're just bought, that's supposed to be you've, there's a typo, this world is, but you've just bought the third Discworld computer game and don't know about 23 books, the maps, the posters, the badges, the beers, the di diaries, the bookmarks, the figurines, the fan clubs, the conventions and very popular cross stitch embroidery designs. Shall we wait for you to catch up? All right. Um, the action in many of the books centers around in in and around the ancient, thriving, and cheerfully corrupt city of Ankh-Morpork. The weather is bad. The lighting is low. <laughs> the streets are mean. Oh yes, <laughs> life is expensive because it's death. Because it's death that's cheap, and the women are pretty tough even without shoulder pads. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. Oh. Thought it was the triplicate of callbacks is the uh, is the funnies, but no, I'm I'm not showing the right window. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Just watching me make a fool of myself. Um, I really need to set up a a, a scene command, don't I? Uh. Oh yes, and it's expensive because it's death that's cheap. The women are pretty tough, even without shoulder pads. People tend to lie a lot and double cross one another. It's a naked city of a million stories, many of them badly spelled and cut very short. <laughs> There are trolls, dwarves, werewolves, zombies, wizards, and vampires among the citizenry. Mostly, they just want to earn their next dollar, and now it's just, and now it's just got its first private eye. He can look forward to being lied to, double-crossed, but that's only the start of his problems, as they say in. 
Sham Haga's House of Ribs. Play it again, Sam. Nice. That was very colourful. I enjoyed that. Uh, this is a story about murder and intrigue. A story about the occult and relics of a forgotten of a forgotten era. It is set on the disc world, a world which is flat and rides on the back of four giant elephants who stand on the shell of an enormous star turtle, Great Atuin, and which is bound by a waterfall. Sorry, and which is bounded by a waterfall that cascades endlessly into space. Scientists have calculated that the chance of anything so patiently absurd actually existing are millions to one, but magicians have calculated that million to one chances crop up nine or time nine times out of ten. The house of ribs is great. Just don't ask me where the ribs come from. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Our hero, if such a word is not too strong of a description, is a man named Luton. Formerly of Ankh-Morpork City Watch, expelled from the watch for taking a bribe, he has only just started to pull his life together after years lost in a drunken haze. Trying to get his life back together, Luton has set up a shop in Ankh-Morpork as the first private investigator. All he needs now is a case. A rough guide to the Discworld. From sea to shining sea, it was the... Epheavian philosopher, Expletus, who provided that first the disc was 10,000 miles across. Viewers from space can appreciate it in full, its vast thir th uh, 30,000 mile circumference, garlanded by the long rimfall, where the seas of the disc drop endlessly into space. It gives the impression, with its continents, archipelagos, sea, deserts, and mountain ranges, that the creator designed it to be looked at from above. <laughs> its tiny orbiting sunlet, with... Prominences no bigger than croquet hoops maintains a fixed elliptical orbit while the disc revolves beneath it. The moon shines by its own light owing to the cramped and rather inefficient astronomical arrangements. Owing to the position of the sun, the hub of the disc is never closely warmed and is covered in permafrost and barbarians. <laughs> It is well known that barbarians prefer tundra to warmer climes, since it is more dramatic to emerge from the screaming tumult of a snowstorm than to be found sunning yourself, <laughs> sunning your pectoral muscles on a deck chair. Uh, conversely, the rim of the disc is covered in sunny islands. Balmy weather and suspicious lack and a suspicious lack of horizon, such is the cost of being flat. <laughs> there are four cardinal directions on the Discworld hub: hubwards, rimwards, turnwise, and wider shins. <laughs> Seasoned travellers have learnt to navigate solely by the sensation that they feel. If it gets warmer, you're headed rimwards. If it gets colder, you're headed hubwards. If you get dizzy, you're headed windershins. <laughs> the geography of the Discworld can be divided into four main continents, excluding the many others which have been sunk, blown up, or have simply disappeared. This sort of thing happens all the time, even on the best regulated worlds. Oh, the first of these four continents is the unnamed continent, of which... The stove plains and the ram tops are a major feature. It stretches all the way from the rim of the hub and finishes around the circular sea, around the circle sea. Its most famous and most pestilent feature is the city of Ankh-Morpork, the oldest city on the disc. 
Ankmore Pork is renowned for its mud, trouble, cabbages, trouble, politics, trouble, mud, and trouble. <laughs> it is here that the game is set. The next continent is Clatch, which contains a dazzling collection of nations including Tsort, Ephib, and Omnia. The city of Al Ali on the hub world coast has been called to the gateway has been called to the gateway to the mysterious continent of Clatch. It's rather like Ankmore Pork, but with sand instead of mud. <laughs> Al Kali's temple frescoes are famous far and wide, at least among discerning connoisseurs. Uh, tours leave hourly from the statue of Offler in the square of 967 delights, but are restricted to males over 18 and married women. The city of Al Kali lies on the river sort, where Chocolate brown waters are framed in myth and lies. It insinuates its way through the brown. <laughs> it insinuates its way through the brown landscapes like long, damp, descriptive passage, descriptive passage punctuated with sandbanks, and every sandbank is covered with sunbaked logs, which of uh of most of which have teeth. What makes Clatch so mysterious? chiefly seems to be the efforts of the Clatchian tourist agency who thrive on making the ordinary exciting and the trivial expensive. The Clatchians are mis meticulous about things that interest them. Also on the river Sort is the site of the ancient city of Sort. Long since destroyed in the Sortian Wars, it's not entirely clear who put Sort to the torch. But it's believed to be the armies of Thebe under Levelius. Lave Levelius. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, it is certain that the cause of the Sortian War was a woman named Eleanor of Sort. Or. <laughs> Srinix. Or. El Harib, or El Harib, it, it it depends who you talk to. Really, beyond that, the legends have a certain pick and mix quality to them, much like the gods of sorts. Some of which seem to have been built from the bits of the creators of the gods had left over. Uh, the Clatchian Tourist Agency runs daily trips to the ruins from the nearby village of Sorta. <clears throat> Home of the Sorties Mint Cake, a rare delicacy best admired at a distance. The existence of the Counterweight Continent, the third of the Discworld's four landmasses, is widely denied in Ackmore Pork. It is not that they don't know of its existence, it's just that they choose not to have discovered it at this time. In fact, <laughs> as every citizen in Ackmore Pork knows, the existence of the Counterweight Continent will remain unknown for as long as the patrician. And Morpork's malevolent dictator says it is unknown. Interestingly, the Agatean Empire. Agatean? The Agatean. Agatean? Agatean. There's no H. Uh, which would be situated on the counterweight continent, if it existed, would deny the existence of any civilization outside of itself. This balance of denial has kept the. Ag Agatean Empire from dealing with outside nations for centuries. However, the Agatean Empire has the unfortunate distinction of producing the disc's first tourist, and since a uh, handful of its citizens have ventured forth into the wider world, the patrician, in his wisdom and benevolence, calls such people spies. Despite a recent political rearrangement, International relations between Ant Morpork and the Agatine Empire remain somewhat frosty. Such is the legacy of the wonderful tradition of distrust and denial that has been carefully cultivated over the centuries. Every citizen in Ant Morpork would be quick to comment on the patrician's benevolence. This is chiefly because every citizen who has been slow to comment on it has found themselves hanging upside down in a scorpion pit. 
Thus maintaining implausible deniability. A man named Two Flower, central to his philosophy, uh, philosophy, was very strong belief that no harm could come to him because he was a visitor. Um, alternative translations include coup, rebellion, and necessary unpleasantries. <laughs> Uh, tradition being the chief manner in which nations avoid having to do anything strenuous, such as thinking. Population of the disc world. Chaotic as it sometimes appears, the disc world clearly runs on a special set of natural, or at least guidelines. The, there is cause and effect. There is eventuality. Things happen after other things. After that, it becomes a little more confusing. The following theory can be timorously timorously sorry, timorously advanced. Uh, the disc world should not exist. Flatness is not a natural state for a planet. Turtles should grow only so big the fact that it does exist means that it occupies an area of space where relativity is extremely thin. Where should be no longer has the veto it has in the rest of the universe. Things that might nearly exist in a real world have no difficulty at all existing in a quite natural state on the disc world. Almost the men amongst the many races that thrive and multiply thanks to the low reality threshold of the disc world. Two of the most successful are the dwarves and the trolls. Trolls hate dwarves. Dwarves hate trolls. It's an arrangement that dates back thousands of years and has accumulated so much ill feeling that the actual cause is now quite irrelevant. In addition to trolls, dwarves, and humans, the Discworld is home to a number of undead. Vampires, zombies, werewolves all coexist with the living. Not always peacefully. But there's something about having a blood-sucking hellspawn living next door that doesn't encourage you to invite them around for dinner. Ankh-Mor Pork. Many philosophers have mused on the reason of for Ankh-Mor Pork's existence. Although a leading theory is that it exists solely to make other cities feel better, Ankh-Mor Pork has been burned down many times in its long history, out of revenge, carelessness, spite, or even just for the insurance. <laughs> Most of the stone buildings that actually make it a city have survived intact. Many people, that is, many people who live in stone buildings, think that's a, that a good fire every hundred years or so is essential to the health of the city, since it helps keep down the rats, roaches, fleas, and of course, people not rich enough to own stone houses. <laughs> they ain't wrong. Thanks, Tito. <laughs> oh. Each time it is rebuilt using the traditional local materials of tinder dry wood and thatch waterproofed with tar. <laughs> Namely, that they invite you back to their house for, to eat dinner. <laughs> that was for the undead bit, yeah. It is generally accepted that the original building in the city was the Tower of Art, around which the grounds of the Unseen University have matured, like mould on a particularly ancient yoghurt. The Tower of Art is known to be 80, 800 feet tall. Time, weather, and indifferent repairs have given it a gnarled appearance. Like a tree that has seen too many thunderstorms, it is topped by a forest of little turrets and crenellations. I only learned what a crenellation was this week. That's very interesting. The little inny outy bits. Um... Around which entire species of beetles and small mammals have evolved, aided by the emanations of magic from the university. In fact, the species of bats, uh, of bats which is known to live at the t at, at the top of the tower, is believed to have developed a language so complex that they decided eventually not to bother using it. Fresh water used to be brought straight into the city centre by a viaduct, which fell down centuries ago. Water is now drawn from shallow wells, thanks to the city's high water table. This, along with the slaughterhouses and cabbage fields, spice houses and breweries, contributes to Atmore Cork's most famous civic attribute, the smell. Citizens are very proud of the smell. On a really good day, they carry chairs outside to enjoy it. 
Perhaps the most useful side effect of the smell is that in its long and undistinguished history, no one has ever invaded Bangmore Pork. <laughs> Ankmore Pork has a thriving, or at least festering, population of humans, and the largest known dwarvish colony anywhere on the disc. It is also home to a growing number of trolls, undead, and other special interest groups. The fact that the trolls and the dwarves, who are historically bitter enemies, do not instigate a state of all-out war is a tribute to the un uh, to the unifying force of the Ankh-Morpork dollar. Of gods, small and dark. The disc has gods, in the same way that other worlds have bacteria. There are billions of them, tiny bundles containing nothing more than a pinch of pure ego and some hunger. Most of them never get worshipped. They are the small gods. The spirits of the lonely trees, places where two ant trails cross, and most of them stay that way, because what they lack is belief. This is not entirely true. Ah, oh, this is for... Where's part 10? Uh, nobody's ever invaded and ranked more pork. This is not entirely true. Technically, the city has been invaded on numerous occasions. In fact, the city welcomes freestanding barbarian invaders. But somehow, the puzzled raiders always find after a few days that they don't own their houses anymore. They don't, they don't own their horses anymore. And with a couple of months, they're just another minority group in its own graffiti and food shop. With its own graffiti and food shops. Um, a handful, though, go on to greater things. Well, that was uh, because what they lack is belief. Talking about gods. Uh, a handful, though, go on to greater things. Anything may trigger this. A shepherd seeking a lost lamb for example may find it among the briars and take a minute or two to build a small cairn of stones in general thanks to whatever spirit might be around the place in a show of its infamous cosmopolitan attitude ankh pork has a temple to the small gods imaginatively called the temple of the small gods the building is the home to a hundred mad prophets abandoning abandoned high priests uh, and the odd born-again cultist who tries to get everyone to join in another chorus of the Ikor God Hates You. Contrary to um, popular perceptions, gods don't play chess. They prefer simple, vicious games where you do not pass transcendence but go straight to oblivion. As fickle, malicious, and dangerous as the gods are, they are like innocent children compared to the old dark gods of the disc. Their names are held in the necro telecomicon. <laughs> their, na <laughs> their names are held in the necro telecomicon, the dreaded liber pan panigarum pulvarum, ruled by the Scrawled by Ahmed the Mad. Uh, what number is that? 12. As indeed, those who've seen the book and survived claim the pages are indeed yellow. Hmm. Dark gods used to uh, used to roam freely on the disc, eating men's souls, destroying the minds of all who beheld them, and generally having a laugh on a Friday night. Now all are either imprisoned or returned to the dungeon dimensions from whence they came. <laughs> I'm not very good at reading, it's good practice. Also, I wasn't expecting this manual to be like an entire Discworld book, but whatever. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. Uh, the Dark God, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Have a good laugh on a Friday night. Dungeon Dimensions, from whence they came. These are the endless wastelands outside space and time, and its denizens are jealous of life and all things alive. People who plan to summon the Dark Gods are usually the kind of people who leave behind a piece of string to guard their house and are prone to shouting incomprehensible oaths at walls. <laughs> We're all fucking here now. <laughs> Uh, I'm on a journey through time and space. Um, the interior of a typical temple 
to one of the old dark gods will disobey a fairly basic rule of architecture by being bigger than the outside. It is likely to be full of corridors, of tunnels, full of unpleasant carvings and occasional disjointed skeletons. Hell lit by a light so violet that it is almost black. The eight-sided crystals set at intervals in the walls and ceilings shed a rather unpleasant glow that doesn't so much illuminate as outline the darkness. The floor is a continuous mosaic of eight-sided tiles. The corridor walls and ceilings are all angled to give the corridor eight sides. Eight, you may be starting to realize, is a number of some occult significance on the Discworld. Uh, this is quite a feat, as octagons do not tessellate. However, the number eight has such a power in magic on the Discworld that it would probably be worth torturing a few geometrists and architects just to get it right. Oh. Races of the Discworld. Humans, Homo sapiens. One of the more abundant races on the disc world are the humans, and easily identified by their strangely fundamental belief that they are clearly more important than any other life form, and that all out of and out of all reality has been genuinely hewn out of the raw stuff of existence solely for its benefit. Dwarves, Hortus decorus, standing on average only four feet tall, dwarves are well known to have mastered the art of sexual equality. Regardless of sex, all dwarves have naturally long lives, by human standards, uh, have equal, equally psychotic reactions to even the weakest beers, and perhaps most tellingly, have equally bushy beards. Nobby Nob's great-uncle had eight fingers, and they burnt him alive outside the temple of Io, after asking him nicely. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, the unusual biological feature coupled... This unusual biological feature coupled with the natural reluctance to discuss their gender causes dwarf courtship to be constant... Const to consist of finding out in delicate and circumspect ways what sex the other dwarf is. No one knows why it is that dwarves who are at home in the mountains lead quiet, ordinary lives, forget it all when they move to the big city and promptly dress in chain mail, arm themselves with oversized axes and change their name to something like Grab Throat Shin Kicker. Uh, trolls. Saltus Faxum. The trolls are a race of silicarious, but humanoid knife. Found chiefly in the Ramtop Mountains, but also increasingly in Angkor Pork and other cities. It is the bane of trolls everywhere that their silicon brains seldom function well in the comparative heat of the lowlands, and consequently, trolls have a reputation of being somewhat slow and on the uptake. Excuse me. However, it would be wrong to assume that even the most intelligent, deep frozen troll could even hope to approach subtlety. Troll courtship, for instance, consists of the male troll hitting his intended as hard as possible with a subtly, with a suitably pretty stone. One particularly interesting species of troll is the gargoyle, which has evolved a symbiotic relationship with gutters, funneling or runoff water into their ears and out through their five sieves in, the, in their mouths, and out through fine sieves in their mouths. They speak strangely because they cannot close their mouths. Because gargoyles often spend years without moving from one spot, they tend to not have names so much as like they tend to not have names so much as locations. Wimsky, Webix, <laughs> Metherushloom. What's up? Welcome in. We are we're reading a manual, but it's turning into a book. Cosmic dough, if you will, hence the idea that the Discord was a half-baked idea. Uh, and you thought buying this game wouldn't be educational, didn't you? Well, where else are you going to run across a word like silicarious, eh? Silacrius? Silac, silicarious. <laughs> Werewolves. Lupus sapiens. The common werewolf, or lupus sapien, is a fairly common sight in the Discworld. In fact, it's a very common final sight in some parts of the disc. 
in Ankh-Morpork, the dead rights movement has helped lank uh, lycanthropes better integrate into society. There's definitely some typos in there. There's an I missing there. Better integrate into society. But their habit of, sh of staring at people's throats while they talk tends to put a dampener on conversations. <laughs> I did and stupidly assume that Emmanuel by Terry Pratchett wouldn't be an afternoon in front of the fire. Uh. I have returned home from Scotland, therefore I am now all your problems. Well, welcome back. Was it nice weather? How was it up there with no riots? Bloody country. We live in the stupid, stupid island. <laughs> It was. Ah, good. <laughs> Everyone's got the, uh... Got island madness. Your son enjoyed your mother's swimming pool. Well, that's great. This <laughs> is... I'm not, I'm not reading that, but that's quite funny. Uh, where were we? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, werewolf senses are considerably sharper than most people's, and in particular, their sense of smell is so acute that they can actually perceive scents. A room to a werewolf is an olfactory history of everyone who has passed that way. The most unusual thing about werewolves is that almost all the legends are true. It is true that the bite of a werewolf causes lycanthropy. It is true that they can only they can only be killed by silver weapons. And it is true that that is a bad idea to tap one on the shoulder, throw a stick and shout, fetch! It isn't true, however, that the sons and daughters of a werewolf are also werewolves. In fact, the genetics of lycanthropes is, or, are rather difficult to predict. And a pregnant werewolf might give birth to a mortal baby, a werewolf cub, or even potentially a puppy. Stuff the child down the loop and punch the child. <laughs> Vampires. Nosferatu sanguinius. Although not especially common, vampires are present in the rich melting pot of Ankh-Morpork. Although they are generally expected to avoid uh, feasting on any old hapless passerby on the grounds that it's really hard to get bloodstains out of a... Uh, out of a shirt collar uh, like werewolves the dead rights movement has done its best to ensure that vampires are fully integrated into society and many find themselves working in jobs where an aversion to sunlight is particularly an advantage practically an advantage such as a night watchman and nightclub bouncers a common problem faced by most of ankh morpork's vampires is that vampirism sits uneasy on the middle classes they are established ways that vampires should look and behave, it seems, and many vampires feel obligated to at least try to behave that way. Nice. Are the trains improving yet? Aren't, aren't, um, aren't Labour supposed to be, like, reconsolidating the, the, the main train routes again? I don't know when the fuck that's going to happen, but if I can travel to go see my friends without having to pay like 200 quid, that'd be nice. Oh, okay, so it really depends on when their licenses end. Don't trust the shaggy wankers. Thanks, Mushroom. Another <laughs> snippet of all caps um, knowledge there. Yeah. It is. Bastard trains. 
often the snag is that these details the wearing of evening dress at all times and so on were designed for people who are tall thin and possessing of a certain style and panache that most of ankh morpork citizenry wouldn't be able to manage even after a 12 week evening course this problem is compounded somewhat by the inherent shaving problem faced by all male vampires since this is one particular activity that is very difficult when you can't see yourself in the mirror oh yeah i wouldn't mind paying through the nose for trains if it was a great a great time but it, normally what happens is i pay nearly like 160 quid for a one-way ticket to birmingham and i have to sit on the floor with nine other people oh so, you know Other races, it is doubtful that a place as inherently magical as the Discworld could ever have a complete list of all the races that populate it. Even the list of other types of undead could take a whole while to complete, which is probably why undead citizenship forms are so hated in Animal Pork. Imps, elves, zombies, demons, gnomes, banshees, dragons, gnolls, fairies, ice giants, goblins, boogeymen, ghosts, and philosophers all help to make the Discworld in general. And and more pork, in particularly an entertainingly dangerous place to live, and that's not to even begin on the list of objects and animals who are more animate and intelligent than most of the humans. The game. In order to get the most out of the Discworld Noir, you will need a Pentium 166 or above. A Pentium 266 is recommended. IBM compatible computer. Windows 9X. Clicky, clicky. I crashed the economy, cabbage. Wait, what? <laughs> Is this... Is this a... Stat with you at the fringe, were you? Is this a comedy act? And she looks a bit like... um. Looks a bit like... What's her name? The cabbage pr uh, prime minister. Uh, that's Liz Truss at a pro-Trump chat. No. You got fucking booed. Led by donkeys. Pranked her ass. <laughs> I didn't look into that. That looks like a hoot. <laughs> Uh, some memories. <laughs> the CD-ROM specs has a thing. It's a four times speed CD-ROM drive. 12 speed recommended, but 16 would be even better. 24. But we're not all made of money. She was in the middle of talking about how Trump is the only one who can unite America and all that shite, and how he can bring about a good economy, and then that starts to come down. <laughs> did, she, did she storm off? Like, what happened? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that all the audience laughing at her was a bit of a giveaway. Although if they were at a pro-Trump rally, who knows? Right. <laughs> Why can't we have these sillies in new games? Honest to goodness, sillies 
Not 40-year-old, washed-up, bad writers trying to connect with the youth by giving characters bad attitudes and shaved scythe partings. Yeah. And saying things like, no cap. <laughs> uh, in general, escape will allow you to skip any animated sequences in the game or to advance through any conversation if you are you're having a character. After the introduction, whether you watch it or not, the game will start. If you wish to load a previous game, F1 to call up the options menu. See you later. Using the mouse. <laughs> if you're stuck, it's worth moving the mouse all over the screen. A good habit to get into is sweeping any new room you visit for tags. It's also worth remembering that some tags may change with time. It's up to you to decide which tags are likely to change. Ah, uh, good. Point and click adventures. Click on the place you want to go. Double click. Right click to look. Uninstalling the game. Wait, what? Where's that from? Twenty eight. Earlier. And ask yourself, why don't I own a mouse? I mean, come on, everyone has a mouse these days. Get with it. <laughs> Get with the program. The style of text description is what is known as in the industry as bloody obvious. However, as a mark of our respect for you, the punter, we include it here anyway. Besides, how many of you read the manual anyway? I know what you like. You get home with your new game and your hot and sweaty palms and you haven't got time to waste with the manual. You just want to hear, you just want to tear it out of that irritating plastic wrapping and get straight into the action. I don't know. No patience in the younger generation. Not like my day. When I was lad, games were in black and white and didn't have CD-ROM drives and you had punch cards and you got to go shop and say, can I have the punch cards for way of exploring fist, please? And stop the shop assistant would punch you in nose for being impudent whelps. Ah, those were days. <laughs> I hope I did the right accent there. Uh, <laughs> why can't we... Ha yep. Did I get my bus pass there? Now. No. We'll be dead. That's what we have to do to qualify for a free bus pass for our generation. Uh... Ooh, walking to a certain part of the area will cause the camera angle to change. If you are too impatient to wait for Luton to walk to an exit, you can double click on the exit and the scene will immediately cut to the next location. Ah. Interacting. There are no hard and fast rules, but you will quickly get the hang of how interacting works. And if you don't, well, the CD-ROMs make for excellent coffee mats. The Notebook Clues Clues are the key to completing the game. Whether you get a new clue, you should think about what that clue impacts on, your or on, in your, on what you already know, and who you can usefully talk to about that clue. Oh, cool. Notebook Structure Learn to use paper clues. It will take you forever to navigate around the notebook otherwise. Remember, you can double click on titles to go to the contents page. 
Okay. <laughs> if the notebook is selected from inside a conversation, this does not happen. Instead, Luton talks to the person in question out the clue. Bags, blah, blah, blah. Hard boiled monologue. Luton, being a private investigator, has a private hardboard monologue going on in his head. This is quite convenient for you, the player, since Luton's hardboard monologue lets you know what he's thinking. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. How to talk to people. <laughs> In the game, that is. If you can't talk to people in real life, we really can't help you. I'd recommend calling a helpline, but if you can't talk to people, how is that going to help? It's getting very, getting very sassy now. How to stop talking to people. In real life, this is usually the easy part. <laughs> uh... Quit playing. This causes you to exit the game. Perhaps because you haven't slept in days. This squad noir can be enjoyed equally well when played with the keyboard. This is, in fact, a fragrant lie. A mouse is obviously a better way of playing, but the keyboard can be used to speed up gameplay. For all those people with a Pentium 133 or above and no mouse, I ask you, why? What possible reason could there be? You have my sympathy. <laughs> Copy protection. Discworld Noir is the product of thousands of man hours of effort and was written by an independent software house, a very talented but not very rich. Therefore, we will be very upset with you if you decide to pirate our game. What's more, if you do this, we'll be forced to unleash our team of hardened mercenaries to hunt you down for sport. We don't like to do that, but these are desperate times. I'm impressed it's still a Sutherland Barnett game. Like... That they made the switch to 3D so competently. Well, I say competently. We'll find out if it was competent, won't we? Um, this world noir did not spring fully formed to life like Athena from Zeus or for a more modern version of the same expression like Xena from Hercules. <laughs> many, many talented people gave their lives so that you could play this game and you really owe them at least the courtesy glance. Uh, I'll bet you're the kind of person who walks out of films before the credits are finished too. Shame on you. I always stay till the end because that's where the fun little Easter eggs are. I saw a really funny clip the other day of um, a cinema full of people watching The Lord of the Rings. It's the bit where he kicks the helmet and just one guy really loudly does a snort and goes, Did you know? And the whole, uh, whole cinema laughed. Which is funny because... It's the, the one annoying guy who always says, did you know he broke his foot when he kicks the helmet? But all of the people in the cinema knew that already, and it became a joke. It also means you ain't queuing to leave, indeed. Or queuing for the lose afterwards. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Any more funny stuff hidden in this? Espanol. All right. <laughs> 